I hope everyone can see my screen. Yes, please. That's it. Um, so the title of the talk is Graphs as Matrices. Um, I want to take a step back and talk about the broader point of the presentation. Um, so the broader point of the presentation is how theory connects to practice. Um, and the, the, talk, the talk has two parts to it. Um, the first part is how theory becomes practice. Um, so as part of this, I will be tracing the idea of graphs as matrices from theory um, into practice. And this, the second part of the pre presentation is essentially how theory informs our day-to-day -day practice. Um, yeah, um, we'll, we'll have a conversation on how it affects, uh, how it informs our practice at Fluxon. And yeah, we would like to hear from you how, um, how it helps your everyday practice. Yeah. With that said, um, let's begin. Let's uh, define our terms, like what we're talking about. Um, so a graph is a structure containing elements in which some pairs of elements are related in a certain way. Um, these, these elements are called vertices, and the relationships between these vertices are edges. Why, um, why bother with graphs? Um, so, um, so graphs are everywhere. Like um, they are, uh, for example, your network of friends, um, the network of uh, roads, for example, um, are uh, the supply chain network, like mean, of the things that you're currently viewing this talk on. Um, all of this, they involve things and relationships between those things. Um, so a graph is a natural abstraction to model all these things. Um, in our programs, usually graphs uh, are, uh, well, some of the common formats that programmers use is an adjacency list is one of them. Um, you can see the representation on my screen. Um, and then, adjacency matrix, uh, which is the uh, which, which is what we're going to talk in um, today. Um, so you can represent a graph as a matrix where um, the edges, uh, sorry, the vertices of the graph are essentially um, the rows. Um, the, the, yeah. And the edges are essentially, uh, if there is an edge between i and j, uh, for example, you put a um, number usually. Usually, I mean, if it's a, if you're just indicating as presence of an edge, you can just say like a Boolean, you can use a Boolean matrix. Uh, otherwise, like then you could also um, put like the length of the edge. Um, so now uh, let's talk about um, the matrix graph duality. Uh, by duality, what I mean is um, matrices are mathematical objects. Um, and matrix operations, so in linear algebra, like you have certain operations that are defined on matrices. You can add matrices, you can multiply matrices, um, you can transpose a matrix. Like when, there are all these like algebraic op operations that you can do on matrices. Um, by duality, what I mean is these matrix operations correspond to some graph operations. Um, and we can use this correspondence between them to build on, um, to build graph algorithms in the language of la linear algebra, basically. Um, we'll go through a sample of like what these look like, uh, what this correspondence, I'll, I'll try to show like, I mean, how, do, how does this correspondence work? Um, what can we do with matrices? What does it mean to the graphs uh, when we do such things on the matrices? Um, let's start with a simple one, like um, matrix addition. Um, you can add two matrices, and you would be getting like a, another matrix, like in this example C. Um, what that means is, to the graphs that these matrices represent is, you are doing a graph union operation. You are basically combining two graphs into one. Uh, by combining, I mean, 
you are combining the set their sets of vertices and you're you're doing a union set union on their sets of edges yeah. uh, that's matrix addition uh, the next operation is element wise product this is different from matrix multiplication that which we'll get to um, so element wise product is basically multiplying the corresponding elements in a matrix just like you perform matrix addition um, Element wise product corresponds to a graph intersection operation. So, a graph intersection is basically if you take a set intersection on the set of vertices between, between two graphs and set of edges between two graphs, that's graph intersection. Um, that corresponds to like element wise product. Um, another common operation transpose, transposing a matrix. Uh, transposing is essentially like switching rows into columns and columns into rows. Um, that um, what it corresponds to is um, if you have a director graph, you are essentially reversing the directions of the graph. That's what you would get. So if you transpose an adjacency matrix, you're essentially reversing the all the edges in a graph. Uh, the next one is exponentiation. Like exponentiation is multiplying a matrix uh, by itself. Um, Depend, depend, um, you can multiply like many, many times depending on the power of um, the exponent, exponentiation. Um, exponentiation, what it represents is if you have a graph, for example, A, and if you multiply by itself, you're getting another matrix A square. So an ij element of this A squared, what it represents is the number of walks of graph of length two, because we just squared two, uh, between the vertices i and j. Like, so when you do matrix exponentiation, like when you're getting, you're essentially computing like when the number of walks between vertices. Um, another thing from matrix algebra is matrix reducibility. Like, so in linear algebra, like there is this concept of like when you can prove that a matrix is reducible or irreducible. These concepts directly map to the concept of connectedness in, in graphs. Um, I'll just define like what connectedness is. So you, you would say a graph is like strongly connected. Uh, by that, what, um, what you would mean is you can start at a vertex, any vertex in the graph, and you can reach every other vertex in the graph. That's what strongly connected means. Um, essentially, like if you can prove that a an adjacency matrix is irreducible, um, that means it's strongly connected. Um, yeah. So essentially, like the the matrix reducibility and irreducibility, they map onto the concept of connected, strongly connected, or not strongly connected in graph theory, uh, in in graphs. Uh, the next one is um, graph traversal. Um, so if you have a graph, um, can you folks see my pointer? I hope you can see the pointer, uh, small pointer, yeah. Um, if you have a graph uh, that's on my left, um, this graph is represented by this adjacency matrix here. Um, I'm calling it A. Um, let's say we are starting with, uh, let's say our frontier is seven. Okay. Uh, I'm representing the frontier seven with this, uh, row matrix. Um, you can see like we have a one entry at seven. Okay. If you do a multiplication matrix multiplication, uh, not the element wise product, um, multiply this frontier with the adjacency matrix, you would get another row matrix. Surprisingly, that row matrix um, is all the nodes that you can reach from seven. Uh, essentially, like I mean, you just got the next frontier, um, three, four, and five. Yeah. If you multiply it again, like you get the next frontier from that. Um, so, matrix multiplication, it's it directly maps to a step of breadth of search. I mean, by matrix by doing matrix multiplication on an adjacency matrix you're essentially performing breadth search. And 
each multiplication here is just one step of the BFS. Um, just to juxtapose these two, um, on my left, you can see how um, people conceptualize BFS. Like you have a frontier that's moving forward. You have a bunch of visited vertices. You have uh, un unvisited vertices ahead of you. Um, and you're trying to get from this frontier to the next frontier. Like, um, that same thing in linear algebraic formulation, like you can see to the right of the slide. Um, just to split all of them separately, you can see how they how they correspond to the matrix equivalence. Um, the graph itself is a matrix here, um, and the current frontier, the next frontier, uh, and the unvisited vertices. Um, that's just a sampling of how this correspondence works. So uh, essentially, by now, like I co I've convinced you that you can do uh, certain things on matrices, and those things correspond to uh, graph operations. And we can use, we can leverage this correspondence for building more uh, uh, more things. Like for example, we just used the matrix multiplication as a building block for BFS. Yeah. For more of this thing, like you can uh, look at this uh, book, um, which is Graph Algorithms in the Language of Linear Algebra. Um, this is one of the foundational texts that summarizes like much of what we are talking about in this in this presentation. Um, next is graphs in that's all theory. Now let's see like how that theory is put into practice. Um, so before we move ahead, um, let's look at why should we? I mean, we we already have a way of doing graph traversal or reversing edges and all these things. Like, why would you want to like reformulate all of them into linear algebra? Like, and what, what do we gain from them? What's the what's the motivation here? Like, um, let's start with like, I mean, um, what's what are what are some uh, problems or uh, that currently folks face with graph processing or graph algorithms in general? Okay. Um, but before that, let's see um, a typical memory hierarchy like um, of a, a, a today, like that that we uh, our programs run on. Um, the point of uh, showing this thing is is memory access is not uniform; it's hierarchical, uh, in the sense that um, there is a difference in access between like your whether you're accessing from like CPU registers or from L1 cache, L2 cache, or you had to, um, you're missing all these L1 and L2 caches. Um, and these, uh, this difference in um, memory access is something like that. That would um, that would be more pronounced as the size of your data increases. Like, uh, that your process increases. Now let's look at like a couple of things that that currently impact um, the way we uh, process graphs today, like um, in general. Um, I'm quoting these things from uh, one of uh, uh, from a paper on like one of the graph databases, like in half of what they summarize it to be like. Um, so. A massive amount of random data access is required during graph processing. Um, and many modern program opt optimizations, they rely on data reuse. Uh, but unfortunately, graph pro because of the random data access nature of the graph processing, it breaks that uh, data reuse premise. Uh, because you're, because of this large amount of graphs that people deal with, like it's highly likely that uh, you're going out of this um, uh, caches or your your access patterns are not like um, they're not predictable. Like um, yeah, you, you're you're jumping in memory basically. Like um, without a careful system design, uh, this would usually lead to um, poor performance since the CPU cache is not in effect most of the time. And another problem is parallelism. Um, parallelism is notoriously difficult when it comes to graph algorithms because of the unstructured nature of the graphs. Um, 
what that means is a lot of graph problems are inherently irregular and they are hard to partition. So you can't, uh, it's hard to uh, efficiently divide and conquer um, uh, conquer your uh, your graph data, data sets. Um, with those uh, problems out, uh, let's look at why, okay, the way we are doing things, like mean, it has some problems for large scale data uh, graph processing. Uh, but why? what does that has to do with like, um, why should we look to adjacency matrices, matrices for now or linear algebra um, to solve those? Like, let's look at the history of um, matrices in uh, computation, like computation with matrices. Like, I mean, let's look at like how mature or how, um, how well like do we, currently use matrices in computation in programming today. Like, um, you might have heard of uh, this library called BLAS. This is at the core of every, uh, not every, but like mo most of the computational libraries are uh, um, libraries that, that are in use like today, like most, most of them today. Um, it started as a Fortran library in 79. Um, their goals were simply like, we should separate, um, sorry, before I talk about goals, what BLAST does is it allows you to efficiently represent matrices and uh, matrix algorithms. Um, it provides efficient implementations to them. Um, so the goals, uh, the BLAST project set, up, set out with these goals of like, um, hey, we should separate the hardware concerns of matrices from the software uh, side of things. So BLAS essentially provides, um, so they have written uh, almost architecture specific stuff. Like, so if this architecture emit these instructions, uh, that level of optimizations um, uh, have been included in BLAS. Like, and on top of uh, these optimizations and this um, uh, these underlying things, um, they have brought the linear, the linear algebra expert, experts to code efficient matrix algorithms um, you, um, to take advantage of all these hardware optimizations. Um, so essentially like BLAS, the goal of BLAS is to provide like efficient representation of matrices and efficient way of uh, performing computation on those matrices. Um, it's very difficult to overestimate the impact of BLAS uh, BLAS is used by, um, like, uh, as I mentioned, many libraries and, um, and computational systems like Mat Mat MATLAB, Mathematica, NumPy, R, Julia. Um, Praveen, one thing I wanted to, to mention here, um, because if, if you represent a matrix um, or a graph as a matrix, you actually get access to the GPU as well. Um, and there are GPU optimized implementations of BLAS. That's correct. Yeah, um, and also the maturity of all these things is like we are looking at uh, this project started in seventy nine. Like so, we are looking at four decades of optimizations. Like I mean, this is a mature piece of uh, software that basically underlies mo all these like numerical libraries. Uh, just to further show the importance of BLAS, um, so this person that you're looking at, uh, he's the recipient of. ACM Turing Award of um, last year's. Uh, so ACM Turing Award is usually said to be the highest honor in computer science. Like it's it's kind of like equivalent to Nobel Prize or Fields Medal in mathematics. Um, you can see in his um, um, contribution statements, like you can see BLAST listed um, amongst many others. Yeah. Um, so this is this is not something from the 80s like we're talking about. This is uh, from last year. Um, um, this is a poll uh, that was run by Nature magazine um, with their readers who are mostly um, either researchers or people who are uh, into writing like scientific code. Um, um, basically, they were asked to like, uh, hey, what are the, what's a piece of software or a library that has most impact um, in your field? Uh, what, what do you think? Like, you can see a bunch of uh, things uh, from them. Uh, you can see BLAS somewhere in the middle there. Um, um, 
um, I've included some testimonials from them, like some statements from them um, of how they're describing Glass, um, of how fundamental it is. Like, I mean, it has made matrix uh, computation as fundamental as like addition and subtraction with numbers. Um, yeah, it's it it provides the fabric on which uh, we do scientific computation. Yeah, if you're thinking like, who are these people who think Fortran is still hip? Um, then uh, I just want to uh, highlight the fact that Fortran is still a major thing in scientific computing in general. Like, for example, I pulled uh, some stats from GitHub. Uh, the first, the top one that you see is from SciPy. GitHub. Um, I, I went to the GitHub repo and just I just pulled the stats. You can see like one fifth of SciPy has is in uh, code bases in Fortran. Like, uh, the bottom one is uh, R runtime, which is also on GitHub. And you can see almost one fourth of it is in Fortran. Like, um, so it's you might not be using it directly, but like lots of things that you use, like or even if you go to go on, if you check some of the climate models that are open sourced on GitHub, like you'll see some of them ninety nine percent on Fortran. Like uh, Fortran is a huge thing, like uh, in scientific community. Yeah, that's my point. Yeah. Um, once in a while, this is a, just a question from Stack Overflow. Once in a while, people um, realize Blast. Like someone, someone here surprised that uh, hey, why their matrix multiplication is uh, ten or fifteen times slower than uh, the Blast implementation. Um, um, short answer is like, man, of course it will be slower. If it, it, Blast will be faster because it's your implementation versus four decades of optimizations you're looking at. Uh, um that's all great like the so i showed you like how mature the computation with matrices is we have fast libraries like if we can somehow convert or use matrices for graphs we can build some fast stuff um but in reality like there are other things like that we will soon hit if we start to if we start doing that like um in real world most most graphs are sparse. Um, and by sparse, I mean they would have lots of um, elements that are um, either, you could treat them as zeros. Like, um, yeah. Uh, so if you, for, I'll give you an example of like, I mean, what, the difference between um, why sparsity is a problem. Uh, imagine a fictional social network. Like, uh, let's say there are a uh, thousand users. Um, so represent. Um, so each of so thousand users means like your graph will have thousand vertices. So that means your matrix is like thousand by thousand. Uh, essentially, like million elements you're looking at. Uh, let's just say for we have each user has about like ten friends on average. So that means we need about um, uh, a thousand uh, edges. To represent this graph, um, so if we represent this in matrix, um, our matrix out of the million elements in our matrix, only a thousand of them are filled. So that's like one percent. We just used one percent of the uh, of the matrix. Um, th uh, that's a lot of uh, sorry, lot of um, uh, wastage of uh, space, basically in storage. Um, so to solve this, we need um sparse matrices um so as i mentioned the sparse ma matrix is uh, is a concept which means that it's a matrix where majority of the numbers large number of the entries are zero basically yeah um and sparse matrix is also a data structure like where um you want to represent a matrix while not storing all the zeros and everything like um and algorithms on sparse matrices, they should also, uh, it's not just about the storage of not storing zeros. It's also about like any operation that you do on these sparse matrices, they should preserve that sparsity. So you don't want to, I mean, for example, if you're multiplying sparse matrices, you don't want a intermediate step to suddenly uh, fill all the elements or anything. Uh, because you, we want to we want to have uh, this sparsity preserved from begin beginning to end in all our algorithms. So um, with that, the reason we can't use BLAS, for example, for normal um, uh, graphs, is BLAS is directed at dense matrices. Um, 
So there is another project that started, so essentially. So Blast started in 79, and in 2001, there was a extension to Blast that started. It's called Sparse Blast, um, essentially to um, provide the building blocks for sparse matrices. Uh, but it had like very little uptake. And in two, 2013, uh, there, the, there is this project that started. It's called Graph Blast. It has very similar goals to Blast. Uh, the only difference between this and Blast is um, we are dealing with graph matrices, sorry, sparse matrices here. And we are the algorithms are more focused on preserving sparsity. And it's also like directed at graph algorithms in general. Um, you can see the equivalence uh, to the right. Uh, this is just a poster from uh, the project of the graph plus, and you can see uh, right of the poster there is matrix multiplication on the left, um, and um, on the right, like you can see there, the project um, the project is basically um, a product of um, of companies like Intel, IBM, and it's also from uh, it has partners from government like National Science Foundation. Um, so it's 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 basically like I mean academia and government research agencies and industry all coming together um, uh, to uh, to basically improve graph processing in general. Um, they espouse similar goals to Blast, which is combine hardware expertise with with graph ex expertise. If we can somehow formulate our alg algorithms in linear algebra, we we can leverage all the optimizations that we have over the past four decades uh, with BLAS, essentially. Uh, some of the benefits um, this project aims to deliver is performance portability, like um, being able to run your, um, uh, so BLAS targets a ton of architectures uh, and things. Like So you'll be able to, um, Target all the architectures that Blast will target, like and concise expression, like uh, in the sense that um, graph algorithms expressed in in this linear algebraic form, they are much more concise than the traditional uh, ones. I'll show you an example shortly. High performance, um, um, the one we were talking like uh, with Blast, like all the performance that you associate with Blast, you you are you are able to um, leverage that. And then scalability, like um, you you would be able to write the same code that you would uh, whether you're operating on small scale graphs or like I mean large graphs. Like um, this is just a um, code snippet that I pulled from the graph last paper. Uh, so the task that they are trying to accomplish is triangle counting. Um, sorry, on the left you can see um, the linear algebraic version of uh, the graph loss version of uh, triangle counting. On the right, it's a, a traditional uh, tri uh, triangle counting algorithm. Like you can see the, uh, this is what I meant by conciseness. Like, yeah. Um, now, uh, putting this all together, um, so what, um, in real world, like you might be thinking, like, hey, are is there anything or anyone like uh, who's using all these things, like, who's making use of uh, all these things? So one example here is uh, at the towards the end of 2018, uh, Redis Labs they launched a product called Redis Graph. It's a in-memory graph database. Um, you can see from the subtitle here, uh, and this is a, just a screenshot of their homepage. You can see from the subtitle uh, of what it's powered by: fast graph processing powered by linear algebra and matrix multiplication. Um, that's what powers <laughs> Redis Graph. Um, 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 in their own words, um, you can see like so. Redis Graph uses um, a language called Cipher, just like SQL databases have SQL. Um, so what Redis Graph uh, does is it takes Cipher and it translates it into linear algebraic operations. For example, this this snippet is showing you an example query. This query is translated away into a sequence of uh, matrix operations um, in order to get you the results. Um, uh, just to show you like the how well this stacks up against other graph databases, 
um, I'm, I'm quoting you a benchmarks, uh, a benchmark from the Redis graph paper. Um, so they were, they took like a couple of data sets. Like one of them is, uh, it's called graph 500. And another one is like the Twitter uh, data set. You can see the amount of nodes and edges in it and, uh, and the system that they were uh, running this benchmark on. Uh, and the task that they were doing is, um, hey, given a set of nodes, find all the nodes that are one hop away or two hops away. Like those are the queries that they're trying to benchmark. Um, this is, uh, these are some of the results uh, from the paper. Uh, you can see Redis graph uh, in some cases like beats almost like all the, all the other ones like in the, uh, that they compared against are almost neck to neck like with them. Um, uh, you can see like at the top it's like one hop query uh, it's essentially like neighbors that are one hop away two hops away and six hops away like yeah um so that's that concludes my talk um essentially i hope you you saw the journey of the idea from from the textbook all the way into like a real world product um at the top, like, I mean, I included the link graph plus, but um, there's also a Python uh, bindings to it. So you can actually explore uh, graph plus in, in a Jupyter no notebook, for example. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's a cool library and you should check it out. It's the last last link on the on the slide. Yeah. Um, with that, I turn it to um, just AJ um, um, to, to talk about like, um, how theory connects to practice in general. Like, yeah. yeah, so what, what, um, what I wanted to say about this is that, that I've, I've seen actually graphs being applied in real world products a few times now. And the, uh, I think there's some examples there. So one example is like the routing algorithms um, that um, like Uber, for example, are using. Actually, I have a friend that worked at Uber that worked on the routing algorithm that was based on a graph search um, system. Um, and we did a project actually at Fluxon, which was about wedding dresses of all things where, um, um, you know, people getting married want to build a custom wedding dress. And so a dress has a bunch of possibilities for how it can be constructed. And it turns out that, um, in order to, um, to model all the dresses that are, that are possible to construct, we have a series of questions that are asked. Um, what sort of skirt shape would you want, the silhouette? And the choices that you make create constraints about what choices you can make in the future, and it becomes convenient to think about it as a graph. Um, so it often might not seem like, at first glance, you have a graph problem, um, but by having some awareness about the tools that exist um, and the fundamentals of computer science, um, sometimes you can, you can recognize something that might be a graph problem. And if you can map it to, um, if you can map your problem to a well-defined graph, um, then you all of a sudden have all of these tools in your kit that you can use to apply to, um, to solve that problem. So um, there's a well-known graphing algorithm or well-known graph algorithm, Jaxer's algorithm for finding the shortest path. So if you want to build a routing engine, um, you know, you've got to start by one way to do that is by figuring out how to map the road network into a graph where it can be complicated because roads have a lot of different um, um, features. So for example, some roads are two directions, some roads are one direction, some corners you can turn left, some corners you can turn right or not at all. You have to go straight. Um, so yeah, be, being very, very careful and very intentional about how you construct your graph um, means that you could just apply directly the off the shelf algorithm um, versus trying to take this algorithm and like modify it by adding a bunch of special cases. Um, you sort of push the complexity all into how you map the problem to a graph and then just apply the standard algorithms. Um, so it's, it's been interesting to see those coming up. Um, that it, it doesn't happen like, every day um but when it does it is pretty um exciting to realize that you have you know a case like that
Thanks, Ajay. Um, should we move to Q and A? Sure. Thanks, EJ and Praveen, for uh, covering such an interesting topic. I'm sure the audience would have loved it and will use these concepts uh, into practice. Uh, now we'll begin with the Q&A. And I would request Babni uh, to share the Dory screen so that we can take the questions that are already posted. Sure, I hope we can see the screen. Yes. So first question relates to the recording and link to the presentation. So we would be sharing it over the email in a few days. So thank you for the comment. We have a question here, AJ and Praveen. Would you like to take this up? Sure. Do, do you know the answer to this one, Praveen, LinkedIn or Facebook? So I, I know for sure. Um, at Facebook, at least, they're using graph databases internally, but I'm not exactly sure how they've implemented the graph database, um, whether or not it's been implemented with the matrix. I have to believe they're they're looking to um, make every optimization they can, so I'd be surprised if they weren't, um, but I don't know for sure. Um, one um, real-world example that I can uh, pull from a big company is look into page rank um, how page rank is defined and you can see uh, page rank is defined in terms of uh, matrix operations like uh, uh, that's one pointer of like uh, thinking or representing a graph in a matrix uh, in, in terms of matrix but in terms of whether they operate on these graphs in a, on a day-to-day -day basis in matrix form um, I would uh, if I had to take a guess like it I would I would say no because um the this algebra linear algebraic form like this is an upcoming thing so redis la uh, sorry the redis graph is a very recent thing currently most graph databases they don't represent uh graphs as matrices for example your um uh, neo4j or uh, arango db like they're not uh represent they're not doing like matrix multiplication like behind the scenes like sure Moving on, we have a comment from Neeraj. The session was excellent and very informative. Thank you, Neeraj. Nimit says, don't really get to work on the core principles and implementations of computer science. So this was really good. Give me a couple of topics to research about during the weekend. Great talk. Thank you, Nimit. We have a question. Any best practices for storing the graphical information into databases? So I have some examples from experience. Um, I I think if you if you have a graph, you're either going to be benefited by using a, a database that's designed for graphs and not not trying to like overload. Um, um, a SQL database and and like regular select, select queries for your graph. You can still do it. It just it probably won't perform as well. I'm um, actually in the the wedding dress um, project I mentioned earlier. We, we started by just modeling it as um, sets of features inside of a SQL database and like iterating queries and the to to solve the constraint problems. Uh, it didn't perform very well. Um, we actually ended up. Um, create like storing our graph as a flat file and loading it into memory and and writing some go code actually to, to search the graph i know actually the um the routing algorithms that i mentioned before are using a similar technique where where they they have generated the, the graph as a file and they're just loading that file into memory and, and um um operating their search algorithms in memory um, but there's there's databases like the ones Praveen mentioned, the Redis graph, as well as Neo4j, which are are optimized for storing graphs and querying graphs. And probably extensions for for tools like Postgres as well. Sure. Raghav says, great talk, a lot of new things to explore and learn. Thank you, Raghav. So we have a question from Anunya. Is there any graph database that uses Graph Plus? 
Um, Redis graph is uh, one example uh, that uses graph plus. Yeah. It's directly uh, built on graph, graph plus. Sure. We have Neeraj who says first of thanks for sharing. Is there any example to connect these graphs in image processing? Um, sure. Uh, graph processing pops up in image processing as well. Like one example I can think of is if you want to segment a different parts of an image, uh, you're effectively looking at uh, graph connectedness. You're looking at like, I mean, hey, what are all the connected areas of my image? All the connected pixels of the image, and you want to identify like um, you want to separate like all these like connected islands essentially. Yeah, that's one example I can think of. I'm sure like their graphs pop up in uh, image processing um, in, in many areas. The the flood fill algorithm, Praveen. So you start with a point, and the point is um, the point at which you're like spilling color out from, and it's actually like a graph search algorithm because it's looking at adjacent points to see if they're the same color, and if they are, it's filling, it's it's switching that color to the the fill color, and then repeating that process, um, and it's it's fundamentally like a, a graph walk. Moving on, the association of metrics arithmetic with graph operations was an excellent moment. Can you please recommend reading material that one needs to learn more? Sure. Um, I've included a, a book reference in the talk, which is um, Graph Algorithms in the Language of Linear Algebra. Um, that's a great book that um, it's it's very mathematical uh, just um just a heads up and it it basically goes over all, most of the common graph algorithms and it reformulates them in a linear algebraic form um yeah um in terms of um reading material like i would suggest check the references i included um uh, there are some talks like I mean, for example one great talk is um Redis graph um, developers themselves, they did a couple of talks, I think, from the Redis Conf. Um, they, uh, yeah, there, there is a session from Redis Conf on like Graph Plus itself and also like how they use Graph Plus um, um, uh, in, uh, in Redis, in Redis uh, Graph. I think we are done with the questions. If you have any more questions, please keep posting them. We still have a few minutes to go. Excellent. Thank you, Praveen. Thank you, Mo, for writing. Thanks for the talk. Please do similar talks in the future, for sure. I think we're we're happy to do it. Actually, it's it's pretty fun. We actually have a um, we do this weekly um, in inside of Fluxon. So this this talk Praveen actually originally gave as an internal Fluxon tech talk, and I think um, we're we're very happy to kind of share more of of that. Um, really excited to be able to have the opportunity to do that. Actually, so thanks everyone for 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 being here and um, to the Python user group and Hyderabad for the opportunity to present. We definitely appreciate it. Yeah, me too. Uh, yeah, I would like to thank everyone for their attendance, and I would like to thank Python, um, Hyderabad Python users for providing us the platform. Thank you all. I think we have covered the questions. Thank you again, AJ and Praveen, uh, for the great presentation and your valuable time. And thank you, audience, for uh, joining in. And uh, thanks, Bhavneet, for being a wonderful host for today. Uh, in case uh, you want any information related to the topic or any questions you feel, you can post that in Dori. Uh, we plan to get back to you over mail. And uh, before we say goodbye for today, uh, we will be sharing the recordings with the audio, with the participants over mail. And do visit our LinkedIn page for uh, updates related to the organization.
and we would also love to hear any comments or suggestions you have or any topic you want to cover uh, in future please submit them in dori your feedback is really valuable to us as uh, we constantly endeavor to evolve and thanks uh, we still have few minutes if in case someone wants to ask some questions I actually even um enjoy hearing from the audience um their own experiences um where, where maybe they they've had a chance to see some of these things in practice doesn't necessarily have to even be graphs but but just things from um from theory or from um you know education that you were kind of surprised to see in practice i, I think a lot of the time as as engineers we are um doing more um, integration type work, um, you know, pulling data from one system and putting it into another and um, displaying it and accepting form entries and entering them to the database. Um, so when, whenever I run into a problem that um, that is um, that requires some deeper thinking, it's always quite exciting and I love to hear those kinds of stories. Uh, hi, uh, hi. Uh, this this is Lilia. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yep. Right. So uh, what you covered is the philosophy of like uh, theory to practice. Uh, what I have experienced is like uh, from one domain to another, uh, mm. especially in software industry, how I related to any of the industry, I see a lot of lot on the like uh, roads and manufacturing, that kind of a thing. Suppose we are creating a highway or so while, uh, you know, uh, the existing one, right, or maintaining it, expanding it, and other things, and still, you know, traffic is still on, or probably ever increasing. It's very equivalent to how we build our software system, or so. So, I like to do that kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, draw parallel and learn from, you know, how these industries uh, uh, kind of pursue or approach that kind of a problem statement and apply uh, solutions in there, and probably we could do the same thing, right? Similar things because software is a different kind of a technology domain or so but underlying principles programs and solutions are very very similar which already exist in the nature somewhere or other. so you're just asking you know about how you apply academics and other things so, uh, i could think of this point yeah, i think i mean we we work across many different domains actually so like mm, healthcare social um some like crypto or web3 kind of projects um collaboration tools and on and on and on um and the 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 similarities are 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 bigger than the differences um it's easy to think in some domain everything is different and nobody else has had these kinds of problems before um and this is a special domain um but but the truth of the matter is actually that um uh, the 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 technical problems end up being quite similar across uh, many many different kinds of problem business domains yeah, that's so true yeah uh anand hi aj hi all uh, so yeah uh, technically i i do not uh, come from a python background so uh, i was just listening and understanding how a matrix is and uh, the graphs can be drawn of course uh, fusion charts in india i i don't know how uh, well it is known across but fusion charts was one which i was looking uh, back in uh, 2013 2014 but a uh, quick question on the way how Fluxon does things. Uh, I wanted a quick overview of what Fluxon does from the project perspective and uh, how do you uh, actually manage your projects? I mean, uh, what, what size of projects are you currently working for and uh, what's your way of doing things? Hmm. So um, we're a full cycle like product development organization. Um, and that means we, we have all the associated um, roles and processes um, for product development, engineering, product management, project management, design, and operations. Um, and you know, typically we're working with um, a customer that has some idea, however well formed it is, um, to to realize the, the, the that idea, um, turning it into uh, a product that exists um, in the market in the real world that, that people can get their hands on and use. Um, depending on our clients, some some of them have more or less of their own capabilities. So we're we're sort of building a team that um, that matches the need 
Um, maybe they already have product management, so we're we're just providing engineering team. Um, but in all cases, we're we're um, taking responsibility for the product and business outcome um, that that is um, needed, um, and and working towards those goals. Um, so I found that like uh, when we're when we're building software, it's often um, it's easy to forget that um, the the technology is there to serve some purpose, um, and that purpose is usually relevant to some people. And ultimately, all software is a service to others. Um, and we, we try to be really mindful of that and, and very focused that our effort is applied in the direction that's going to actually make the difference for the people and not just purely of our own technical self-interests. Um, so, so that's that. As far as how we manage the projects, um, you know, typically we're, we're using some sort of agile kind of process. We, we do some planning. Um, we have like a requirements document. We try to be as very specific about what it is we're trying to build. Um, I mean, to the point of like um, thinking through all the users, all the things that those users need to be able to do, um, the the data that they're operating on, and what is it, and the kinds of operations that need to happen, and and really really digging into, um, you know, down to the level of, okay, when you click this button, what happens, um, and and being very very clear about that, make sure everybody understands, it stands it at that detailed level as well as the higher level, the, the business level, um, and creating some engineering design, um, creating a, a a project plan that is. Um, uh, iterative and driven by milestones. So we're, we're working incrementally and we're not trying to build the entire thing all at once. Um, usually starting up, you know, with the things that are most necessary to understand whether or not the product is a good idea in the first place, if it's like to build an MVP or the, um, the requirements that are most critical to business operations. If, if it's, um, something that, you know, is, is a bit later stage of a project product. Um, and and yeah, then then working iteratively um, through our our sprint process. Hopefully that answers the question. Yep, sounds good. Uh, I would also request sometime when you are deep diving into one of the sessions where project management principles or something related to the management principles mm. want to talk about. I would like, love to hear about them as well. Mm. In the future. Sure. Okay, it'll be interesting. I um. I think one of the only thing I would say here at this moment is um, I, I often see um, project management, um, which is very focused on like sort of agile metrics. So um, you know, if 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 you're measuring your project success by how many tickets you've closed, and that's the key metric, um, it's it's very likely you'll you'll have some challenges because you're. You're not thinking about the metric that matters most, which is like, is this product satisfying its user base? And any anything other other than other than that is um, not necessarily related to whether or not this product is going to be successful. Um, so when we think about about project management and, and goals of project, like we we are we're making sure we we have a process around tracking what we're doing. Um, but the process itself isn't the goal um, for the team. It's it's a thing that facilitates um, the, the 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 real um, purpose of the effort. But I'd actually be very happy to talk more about it. Absolutely. In a, in a full the, the focus right now is shifting. Uh, I, I feel uh, from the agile perspective, we are no more talking about the story points, rather the value points that we add to the system. So uh, that's where I wanted to understand how Fluxon mm. does, and uh, what is uh, your, uh, what's your take about these metrics? Because uh, everything, mm. every individual or every organization has their own way of uh, measuring success. So uh, mm. while at Flux we think about velocity as uh, value points uh, rather than just switching about the story points. So wanted to understand more about how industry is shaping or how other organizations are perceiving this uh, measure of success. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I had a software engineering class in college that I took, and I thought it was going to be to teach us how to make software projects. 
Um, like, I thought we were going to build something. And I was so disappointed when we spent a whole semester reading about Waterfall and Agile and um, uh, what's the other one? I can't remember the name. Uh, iterative. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter. So we, we read about all these processes and we didn't write any software. And it was all um, very abstract, like reading about process. We didn't even operate one of the processes. Um, and so, I, I, yeah, I remember just being really disappointed that I, I learned about it from a theory perspective, but um, right. your, your process is only as good as the product it produces. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I also want to add, like, um, some of the theory is important because uh, remember, a project involves not just code, it involves people as well. So it's like people plus um, all the technical stuff, like I mean, they have to mix. Uh, so that's where like process comes in. Uh, bringing it back around to um, the original talk today. So a, a big reason why you wanna have a process and, and some planning is because uh, every product development um, cycle um, ends up having some dependencies and dependencies block each other. And actually it's, it's a graph. Um, so your, your planning process is like mapping out that graph of dependencies and making sure you're sort of starting at, at the, the core dependencies, the root dependencies, um, because you can't actually even start working on the things that are at the leaves of that graph until those other things are in place first. Um, yeah. Just a funny parallel. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Anand, for the question. I think I think we have uh, like done with the session for today. And uh, again, I I mean we would love to hear your feedback and thoughts about this session. Thank you for joining in. We hope to see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Really appreciate the questions and, and discussion, actually. It was really fun. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.